So I decided one day to get a dog sledding license. Luckily for me, there's a company that holds a one-day class that helps you do just that. They even take you on a three-day mini expedition. The only catch is that the company is located in Tasilik, Greenland. To get to Tasilik from New York, you first have to take a flight to Iceland. From Iceland, you fly to Kusaluk Airport. From Kusaluk, you then take a helicopter to Tasilik. Tasilik is a colorful little town with a population of about 1,500. Because they're so cut off from the rest of the world, the people are very self-sufficient. In fact, you can go to the grocery store and pretty much find anything you need to survive. The only thing they don't seem to have are American to Greenland electric power adapters. You know, for uh, cameras and stuff. The next day in class, I picked up pretty quickly how to harness the dogs, tie them to the sled, crack the whip, and use the brake. But if the dogs don't know you, it really doesn't matter what commands you give them. Right now, I'm at the wheel, and I gotta keep these guys from moving, and I don't have a whip, so they don't listen to me. I could be pretty much saying anything. Although I get them to quiet, I go, The good thing is the dogs already know where the trails are and the guys aren't going to let you get into trouble. All of us passed the class with flying colors. The morning of the trip, we got to Julius's house. He already had the dogs ready. It was a beautiful day, perfect blue skies, great visibility. We immediately hit the trails. The good thing about the trails that are around the town is that they're constantly being packed down. It had been snowing really hard the whole time I was over in Greenland, so there was roughly about two feet of fresh snow on the ground. But as long as you stayed on the trail, you were fine. The dogs had an easy time pulling the sled. The further you got away from town, the harder it was for the dogs. Now, that didn't really concern me until we got to the edge of this big ice lake that we were sledding along. I saw one of the sled teams way up ahead start pushing this thing up the hill. For some reason, I thought you're just going to sit on the sled and the dogs are going to do all the work. But when you get to the hill, the snow is a lot deeper and you know it's a lot steeper and you've got probably two three hundred pounds worth of tents food and knickknacks and flashlights whatever on the sled so you gotta push it these hills are actually hard enough to walk up in the summer if you're just hiking by yourself in shorts but you're in all this gear and you sometimes knee high in snow and sometimes if you step off the trail you wind up waist high in snow and you're pushing this sled full of food and whatever alongside a guy who's been doing this every winter since he's a kid. So I'm huffing and puffing and out of breath, and he's barely even phased by it. And, you know, you get to the top, and he says, that was a good one, but wait till the next one. And I'm thinking, there's more? Um, and you just look off into the distance, and there's there's a lot more. Uh, there's no shortage of hills in Greenland, I can assure you of that. Sometimes when you get to one of these hills, there's no trail. And because the dogs have been trained not to go off the trail, you now have to make one. So you've actually got to walk up the hill, make a path for the dogs, come back down, get the dogs, and then go back up the hill again. It's amazing that this guy can push this thing up all these hills and then smoke. <laughs> For the most part, the dogs seem like typical dogs. Sure, their fur is a little oilier, their body is a little hardier, and overall they smell like a raccoon, but if you didn't know any better, you would think they could be someone's pet. But when you get these guys harnessed up and in front of a sled, they just want to go. And they don't even know where they want to go, but they want to get there now. In fact, one of the dangers of dog sledding is simply letting go of your sled. If you do this, you'll watch your only mode of transportation run away with all your supplies, leaving you stranded. I was told that a dog team would only stop running once they get home or when they pass out from exhaustion. Either way, you're not getting home. Occasionally the dogs get into disagreements with who should run the pack. The pack leader's constantly keeping the dogs in check. Unfortunately, no matter who wins the discussion, there's usually injuries on both sides. Leader of the trip, he's been got into four or five fights, one last night, one today, one before, trying to assert his dominance while the other ones uh, they're trying to take his place. 
Originally, I was under the impression that they didn't really want to pull the dog sled, but after seeing them in action, it's as if they almost couldn't get enough of it. When it came time to harness them up, they would go nuts and start jumping around. The only other time they would act like that was when they were being fed. You also had to be careful how you treated them when they were in a pack. Treating one dog favorably by petting him or giving them food might instigate a fight between them and the other dogs. However, when they're on their own, they're safe to play with. There was only one dog that was consistently cold. He was a pup in training to be the next pack leader. And whenever the temperature was below zero, you'd see him shivering. So Julius, this little guy's three months old? Yes, this one. <laughs> I think that's why he, he's freezing a lot when he uh, eats this with the snow. Uh huh. Make him cold. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> this is a typical restaurant in Greenland. <laughs> so I have a food one here. And crossing fish. <laughs> we ate a mix of things along the way. This is a new trip for some of the guides, so they brought everything from Nutella and instant soup to canned ham and polar bear meat. We actually had enough food to stay out for a week, and that was intentional. Snowstorms have been known to pin people down for a few days. Water wasn't an issue for obvious reasons. Along the trail, if we needed more water, we simply dug up some snow and melted it. Our first campsite, we stayed next to an ice cave that had natural spring underneath it. Yeah, don't forget the cube. <laughs> have a nice cube. <laughs> Keep it cold. Milano whiskey. Yeah, whiskey, yeah. Whiskey. At the next campsite, we took turns digging a hole to get water. Apparently, it wasn't necessary, but one of the guides simply wanted to see how thick the ice was. Turns out, it was about five feet thick. That's pretty much as fresh <laughs> water as you're going to get. While we were on the trail, occasionally we'd stop to eat, rest, or sometimes just explore the area. We came across a newly formed ice cave that one of the guides was eager to check out. In hindsight, it was probably pretty dangerous to follow the guide in the cave, but I figured when in Greenland, do as the Inuit do, take photos. For obvious reasons, going uphill is a pain in the ass. But barreling downhill, holding onto the back of a dog sled, loaded with a couple hundred pounds of gear, standing about a foot above the ground is exhilarating, especially when you're being pulled by a pack of dogs. But you have to make sure you keep a good distance behind the dog so the ropes don't get tangled up. But more importantly, you don't want to run over a dog. So we're about a kilometer away from Selik, where at the end of our three days, I was able to drive down some pretty big hills. That was fun. And uh, yeah, we're all tired. I'm gonna take it easy. And then Julius is going out hunting for the next couple days because this wasn't uh, cold or strenuous enough for him. Canada Goose Gloves, $100. Canada Goose Jacket, $550. Going out on a trip in Greenland, dog sledding? Well, I wouldn't say priceless. It was actually $3,400. It's pretty expensive to freeze your ass off. I could've just bought a freezer, and sat in it, and done push-ups, smelling dog poop. <laughs> While on the trail, I didn't have to wear much because the physical activity helps keep you warm. I wore pretty much whatever a skier or someone shoveling snow would wear. Even in sub-freezing temperatures, I would only wear a fleece. But after we got to camp and we were mostly standing around or taking photos, it got cold fast. This is when I would wear every art of clothing that I had. In fact, I actually brought a second jacket and second pair of gloves, and I was thankful that I did because I sweat through the first jacket, and it was nice to be able to put on a nice dry heavy down jacket when I got to the campsite.
Before you leave Tasilik, make sure you check out some of the local artists in town. A lot of them make these little statues called Tupiloks. Tupiloks are sort of like a really mean black magic bad luck charm that will come to life and kill someone you absolutely hate. But if you don't believe in that, or if you do believe in that, then you're in the right place if you want to get one. The perfect place to warm up after spending so many days in sub-zero temperature is Iceland's Blue Lagoon. You have to stop in Iceland on your way back from Greenland anyway, so you might as well check it out. And despite what anyone tells you, the Blue Lagoon is not a naturally occurring hot spring. It's actually runoff from a geothermal power plant nearby. But don't let that get you down. Apparently, the white mud is supposedly really good for your skin. <laughs>